An educational comedy. It's not a cause. Not a movement. It's not a social group you can slap a label on to. It's an idea. It's an intention. It's an intuition. A mindset in which reality can be explored. It's a genuine expression. A sermon. Critical thinking and imagination. To look inward upon ourselves. To better understand the external world around us. And yes, few egos are bound to be bruised. With our silly, strange, politically incorrect, pure time and velvet style of going about things. Real, Real and raw honesty. Which invites you to be to the, the fullest. fullest. Hi folks, this is just to alert you to the upload of my presentation at Boom in 2014. The name of the presentation is Reclaiming the Earth, and due to YouTube limiting my account here on YouTube, I'm not able to upload full-length videos, so I have uploaded it to Vimeo, and you can click the link in the video description to go directly to that video, and I will upload the video to YouTube once my account has been cleared. It had a six month penalty put on my account eight months ago and I'm still waiting for it to be cleared. So as soon as it's cleared, I will upload the talk to YouTube as well. Meanwhile, it is available via the link below. I hope you enjoyed the talk. I think it was one of the better presentations I've done. And I'll speak to you again soon. In La Cache. The Boom Experience is not just about putting on a production. It's about the family behind it. And it's about the people that put this together, that come out here <clears throat> for months and work in the heat of the day to build this thing as a gift that we give to all of you. And some of us are used to it because we've done this before. We're used to the lifestyle, we're used to the grueling, long, hard, laborious days, you know, labor-filled days. And, uh, but often some people who come and are part of the boom experience don't really understand it. Now, it's really grueling to be out here, you know, for a couple of months ahead of time. You know, it, it, it wears you down over time. Uh, but imagine how you guys feel now just on Saturday. You know, imagine kind of the most tired, the most hot, the most burnt out you felt. And then kind of project that over a long period of time. But now imagine that you're somebody like Max. And just before Max got here, uh, there was a lot going on in his, in his reality. And uh, he's going to talk about a lot of it. Uh, but one of the things was that he's very close with many people in the Gaza Strip, and part of the Palestinian Authority in Israel. And the current conflict that's going on uh, hit him directly in a very personal way. Uh, personal friends, family that he really cares about. We're trapped in the middle of this, this terrible thing that's going on. And so here he was for two months dealing with this while I'm communicating with him about a Psytrance festival. You know. And uh, he's trying to justify in his mind why he wants to take time away from something that is about as real as you can get to come to a place that is about as beautiful, peaceful, and surreal as, as you can find. And I kept telling him, it's because this is a unique place. It, it really is. It, this isn't just marketing slogan. This isn't just like trying to sell you guys a new soft drink. This is really about communicating that 
Boom is a social experiment, and, and a real one, because it creates places like this, where, where else do people from all over the world come speaking 30, 31 languages on site, 150, 160 nations represented, to come together for one week to learn, to share, to dance, to love, to grow. Now maybe that sounds really idealistic and maybe my inner hippie is really rocking today. But if you really look at it, this place is built with love. It is about love. To be no music the people who work together as a crew are a family. All of you are our family. And all of us really, seriously, have the ability to change this world. We do. And our next guest is one of those lights in the distance that many of us see and many of us are following. He's a kind, wise person. He's a friend. He's a hell of a speaker. You never know what he's going to say. But we are extremely honored, yeah, to have my friend Max Egan here at Liminal Village. Give it up for Max Egan. Thank you, Charles. That was a wonderful introduction. Thanks for having me here, folks. It's a great honor to be here. I almost didn't make it. As Charles said, I've, there's a lot going on in my life at the moment. I was actually supposed to go into Gaza Strip in uh, July and spend July there, spend Ramadan there, making a documentary about a young girl. But uh, I kept waiting, waiting, waiting to book the flight to Europe to come and do Boom. And I kept saying, hang on, hang on, you might be able to book me from Cairo yet if I can get entry into Gaza. But it started to get too late, and I said, no, nah, just go ahead and book the flight. So they booked it, and then four days later, I got granted entry into Gaza. But the flight had already been booked here. Had I waited another four days, I would be in Gaza Strip now, trapped there with everybody else. So it's, a, it's been an interesting experience. <coughs> the, whole, um, the whole thing really did affect me. I was gonna actually do a whole talk on Gaza. It fixated me so much. And, and as uh, Charles said, when I came here, I, I felt like I'd, I'd stepped out of something that I really needed to be participating in. I felt like I was betraying my friends. But coming here has actually been quite a healing experience because this festival is different to other festivals. Something that I've seen here is that people are really looking for solutions. It isn't just all fluff. You get that at a lot of festivals. There's a lot of drugs and a lot of fluff, a lot of new age. But there seems to be a lot of real talk about solutions here and real attempts to address the shadow. Because there is a big shadow. We've got a big problem in the world, folks. The world, that's us. Beautiful place. Beautiful place it is. It's an incredible planet that we live on. And it's a planet like no other. It really is. But we're not really doing the right thing by it. It's, uh, it's looking a bit of a mess at the moment. We've just not been paying attention. Many people believe that we can just meditate our way out of this as well, you know, like... We get sort of this new age mentality. We think we can just sit there, love and light, concentrate on the good. Don't pay attention to the darkness. Don't pay attention to the shadow. We're taught that where attention goes, energy flows. But what about that atrocity that you ignore persists? Because that's really the reality of it. I've found that if you don't give attention to these things, the energy flows there. You've got to give attention to them in order to deal with them. There's a wonderful quote by a man, I can't remember who it is, but he said that if you look into the mirror of evil, you don't see the evil in yourself. What you discover is the goodness in yourself. Because what happens when you look into the mirror of evil is you have the opportunity to deal with that evil. And that's what I think we've got at this time. I think this is an incredible time. It's an incredible time in history. Because never before in history have we had the mechanisms of the system laid so bare for all of us to see. It's right there and it's giving us the opportunity to fix it. And that's really what's happening in Gaza as well has gotten to such a bad point that we, it's in our face now and we begin with an opportunity to deal with it. This picture here, as I said, you know, people think you're gonna meditate and, and love and light and get to, the, uh, get to the new world, discover a new cosmic reality if you stay in this dimension. This picture is actually um, uh, called the Flammarion. And what it actually depicts is the, the monk who claimed that he had discovered the place on earth where the sky and the earth met 
And I think that uh, if, you, uh, if you think you're going to meditate your way out of this, then it's about as real as that picture. So we are in for a reality check ahead, folks. And I'm going to touch on a few things here. Well, who knows what I'll touch on because I've got so many ways I could go. I normally do quite long talks, so it's, it's, it's interesting for me to do a short one when I've got so much on my plate. But uh, we'll just see where we go with it. But the fact is that we, we create reality ourselves. And we've created this. Can, you know, all of us collectively have created the mess that we're in. We can blame people all we like. We can blame the governments. And sure, there's a, there's a good deal of blame to go there. But ultimately, the blame comes from us because what exists on the planet really is just people. It's all just people. We're all in this together, you know. Government only actually exists in a book. It's just an idea. That's all it is. People wrote all this stuff down and these guys with expensive suits go to these big buildings and they do what it says in the book. You know, and if, if they can't steal from you, if there's a new way they can think of to steal from you, they write it in the book. They put a stamp on it and now it's a law, we can do this now. That's all government is, it's just an idea. It's a meme, it's not real. It's something that we believe we need, but I don't think we do. And I think there's a way through it if we, if we realise that. But we do create reality ourselves, we've created this whole mess ourselves. We really have. So what do we want? What sort of world do we want? We want a world of abundance, a world like this, or we want a world like that? Because that's the world that we're creating by our in inability to, to look at ourselves and our inability to face the problem, our fear in facing the problem. Ultimately, it's all fear. It's all fear. Many people who say, you know, you, you can't look at the negative, you, you're putting this negative vibration in my life, you've got to keep yourself in a high vibration. I can keep myself in a high vibration by looking at the negative. I can, because it gives me the opportunity to heal it. And, and that's what it is, it's about healing. If you don't know the problems there, how are you ever going to heal it, you know? So what do we want again? Folks, we want this or we want this? And this again is Gaza Strip. We want a world of war or we want a world of abundance? What do we want? I think a world... Abundance. Is that Israel? Yeah. Hello, darling. Nice to see you here. Uh, not, not right now. This is actually my country, folks. This is Australia. This is the Kimberley Whoa. Coast. This is a beautiful place. It's a very powerful country. This is the mouth of the Rainbow Serpent. It's a beautiful place. This is where I live. This is the valley just over the hill from where I live. Beautiful place. Beautiful place. These are some trees up behind my place. I just wanted to show you all this stuff because I love it. It's a beautiful world. It's a truly beautiful world. And these are my people. I count myself as part of the original people of my country. I really do. I was adopted into the Numbal tribe in Western Australia. And these are beautiful people. They've been having a slow genocide carried out against them for 200 years now. And people aren't really paying attention to that. It's happening everywhere. What's happening in Gaza is happening in Australia. It's just happening slower. It's happening in many places. It's happening all over the world. It's happening in Rwanda. Look at South Africa. Look what's going on in Venezuela, Panama, everywhere. But again, folks, it's, it's, it's us. It's us not dealing with the situation. But these are my people. This is a friend of mine, Kerry Ann Cox. My dream is for all people to become one with all living beings. But we are, we already are, that's the thing. And we forgot it. The animals know it though. They know that we are. That we're all one, we're all connected. How I got here is a really interesting thing. How I got to be doing what I'm doing. I've been awake for a really long time. I woke up when I was four years old. When we went out in the country with my mum and she told me, this, this is, we ran out in the forest and I'm going, this is beautiful. Let's come and live here. And she said, well, we can't. And I said, why? She said, because we don't own the land. I went, own the land? What do you mean own the land, Mum? And she said, well, you've got to own the land. I'm saying, well, I don't, ha, ha, who owns the land? She said, the government owns the land. I said, how do they get it? She said, well, you'll understand when you get older. And I went, no, nah. no, nah, I'm never going to understand this. And that's when I woke up that something was terribly wrong with the world. And I'm walking around in my yard with my teddy bear going, it's all fucked up, teddy. <laughs> this is, I've been born into the wrong place. It's all fucked up. And with my little teddy bear, you know. And then I just went through life, bumbled along, worked as a musician my whole life and lived on the outside of society, expressing the art of my life because that's what I perceived my life to be. Art, an artistic statement, an artistic expression of creation, like everybody. That's what you are. All of you are artistic expressions of creation. And that's what we've lost. We've lost the art of our life, the art of ourselves, the art of living, the art of doing this, the art of abundance. There's a barrier. Barriers have been put there, but they're fiction. They're fictional barriers. The abundance is there and the oneness is there. I lived on the outside of society for many years as a musician, as just doing what I could do. And then when 9-11 happened, I thought, well, hang on, it's about time I started putting my research to use and starting waking people up to the fact that we've got some serious problems here. So I started 
hitting chat rooms and doing what I could to wake the world up and meditating and trying to find a way through it. And one day in 2008, I had this experience. I was sitting in my chair. I'll share this with you because you'll probably be open to it. But I was sitting in my chair and I had this, this experience where I, I found myself sitting within my heart, within the center of my heart. There's like a space in my heart. I'm sitting there and I'm looking out. I can see my body and I can see the outside of my body. It's all mesh and I can see a universe between myself and the outside of my body. Every cell in my body, every atom was a solar system. Every cell was a, was a, a galaxy. Every organ was a supercluster. It was a whole universe. And I could see outside it. I could see the streets. I could see the walls of the house. I could see everything. And then I realized that I was also sitting inside myself, inside myself. I was a fractal. There was three of me. And I was sitting there and I could see everything. And it was all just mesh. And I could see the whole world. It was incredible. And then this light developed at the top of my head and it fell right through the center of me. It went right through all three of me. And it hit the ground beneath me. And it started to ripple in white light. And everything just went whoo. And it opened up and I connected with this multiverse. And I connected with everything. And I felt all of the love and all of the pain of the universe. And of, of quantum universes. It was, it was an incredible experience. And I fell out of my chair. I went <gasps> And I fell out of my chair and I landed on my knees and I cried for seven and a half hours. Even thinking about it now, I'm fighting back tears. It was the most incredible experience. And I couldn't even talk to anybody about it for about a week. Because if I tried, I, I would start to sob. And I, I connected with everything in that moment. I realized that we, we create all this ourselves. There's only one of us here. There's actually only one of us here expressing itself in billions of different perspectives. Consciousness, your consciousness isn't local to your body. It exists out here in the field. This is a vessel that downloads a frequency. That's what you are. You're a frequency of universal consciousness expressing the art of itself. And you're absolutely perfect. Everybody is absolutely perfect in everything they do. That's, that's one of the things about this system. We've been trained to think that we're all imperfect. We're given these parameters to measure ourselves up to, but they're not real. They're other people's parameters. The only judgment you should ever put on yourself, if you put any on yourself at all, should come from yourself, because that's the only, only thing that's really important. You are a perfect expression of consciousness just as you are, because consciousness needs to experience itself from that perspective. No one can be you better than you. Nobody. Nobody will ever see the world from your perspective. No matter how close it is, they will never view the world through your eyes. That experience is unique to you, and that is what makes you, you. And that is the only thing that separates us, that we all view the world from a different perspective. But it's perfect. It's perfect for what it is, because that information is needed. It's needed, and no one can be you better than you. And being you is what you came here to be, obviously, because that's who you are. So why on earth would you consider yourself anything but perfect? Because you're all perfect. You see, we're given all of these artificial parameters, and they're not our own. You know? Whoa. This, I reckon, represents the state of human consciousness at the moment, folks. Given our society, given the state of wakefulness, and given where we could go, I think about this as where we are. And that's what's so important, again, about these type of, type of gatherings and talking about this type of information and people discovering their own perfection. Because if we don't do something about this, if we don't do something about the situation of the world, we're going to head sail off the cliff. I mean, we're sailing off the cliff now, and we need to pay attention to it. Of course, this is how it's done, folks. We'll run through the summary of the world, hey? This is, this is my summary. And this is, of course, all my perspective. All I can offer you is my perspective. That's all anybody can offer you. When you're listening to any researchers, that's all they can offer you is their perspective. It's important to remember that. You know, I mean, I, and I used to go down the rabbit hole. I used to look for all the people to blame. The Illuminati, the this, the banking system, the this, the that, the that, whatever. It's all external. It's all here. The change has got to come here. It really does. But this is how they do it. They send you to school. You stop feeling. You become these drones. And then, of course, when you leave school, they teach you what reality you should adhere to. That's the way they do it. And, of course, the people will believe what the media tells them they believe. Not even what the media suggests they believe, it tells you what you believe and you believe it. It's the same with the education system. We're always trained to think in language, have you noticed that? The whole education system is designed at the left brain and you always think in language. So you only have this understanding of reality which is based on your understanding of the language. And in, in languages like English, there, there are no real spiritual perspectives to be gained from this language. It's very hard to convey spiritual understandings to people. 
you look at the word Dharma. The word mm. Dharma, you can, you can follow the right, do the right thing in the right way at the right time for the right reason, follow the path of Dharma, find your true place in the universe. You could write a whole book on how Dharma works to explain it to someone who speaks English. But if I'm in India and I speak Hindi, I just have to say Dharma and they know exactly what I mean. We don't have words like that. The, the language has been changed. We're trained to think in language. And so we have this limited understanding of reality based on the language that we've, we've got. We're not taught that we're unique. We're taught that we're individual. What is individual? In divide you all. We're divided from each other, but we're not really. We're unique to each other. It's a different perspective, you see. But the people believe what the media tells them they believe. They believe everything's okay. They believe they should eat this rubbish that they're fed. We've got some uh, problems there. Maybe the, the wedge, it's probably the wedge. I don't really need the wedge. You can turn that down. We're taught to believe and then we're, we're let out into this system of credit. We go down the credit trap. We go down the path of, of gain, thinking that that's what it's all about. Again, it's, other officials, it's artificial parameters. It's other people's idea of what success is. We're taught that success is climbing the social ladder or it's economic gain, but it's none of the above. Success is health. Success is friendship. Success is companionship. Success is expressing the art of yourself. That's what success is. I know, I know a guy in Adelaide, he, was a, he had a multi-million dollar company and he gave away all of his assets, gave his house to his wife, cancelled all his debts and hitchhiked around the world and he said he's never been happier now that he gave everything away because all of that stuff was just tying him down. It, it, it owned him. That's the thing, the fraud of ownership. But that's what we do, folks. We go down the path, we get stuck in debt, we carry the debt around for us all our lives, and then we pretend to enjoy it. This guy's having a great time. He's got his remote control, his football, his team's winning, he's got his beer, his chips. He doesn't even notice he's chained to a wall of debt. And that's our society. That's Western culture to a T, that picture. David D is a brilliant artist, absolutely brilliant artist. But what it is, folks, is people farming. That's what our governments do, they farm people. All we've got is a system of, of organised debt slavery. And what they harvest, people think that, OK, they're, they're stealing from us, they're stealing our money from us, they're stealing our possessions from us. But what they're stealing from you is you. They're stealing your soul from you. They're stealing your time from you. All that we do is trapped in this fiction that we believe is real. But it's not real, it just exists in a book. This whole government system only exists in a book. It's all a fiction. That's, that's the world that we've got, folks. That's a perfect example of capitalism. When you can enslave your fellow humans and rape the planet and be praised for your good business sense. See, what we've got is a sociopathic society. You know, we've got a society that's trained it, it, it's trained to produce sociopathic behaviour from within people, even if they don't want to be that way. Because we've, we've got to profit all the time, we've got to make money all the time, we've got this barrier between us and the abundance of the planet, which is money. Money could work, but the money system that we've got, the fiat money system, it just doesn't work. We talk about it, we complain about it, we have protests about it, we write books about it, but we don't ever see any change. Why is that? You know? We're not going to get change from government. See, that's the thing. This is all they do. They just churn out more money and keep it going. That's what government's for. Keeps you locked into the system, and that's the result. That's what we get, you know? That's the sum total of our lives within this system if we work hard, and it's just not acceptable. We can, and as I said, we can talk about it all we want, but it's not gonna, not gonna work. We can ask the government for help, of course, and they may give us some help, but it will not always be the help that you want. That's the thing. And it's hard to tell the kids these days because they're just too busy, lost in the virtual world, off texting, you know? So we've got to think outside of the box, folks. We've got to think outside of the box and remember who and what we are. Now, I really believe that who and what we are is essential. It's the, it's the key to the whole thing. As I was saying before, this is a vessel just downloads a frequency. We're all in this together, in La Keshe. That's the thing. See, all of the problems that we've got, whether it's the government, whether it's the, the pollution, whether it's the oil spills, whether it's the, the, the war in Gaza, whether it's anything, it all comes down to a loss of self, a loss of us. You know, these sorts of communities are great, but they only last for six days, and then we go back to the grind. What we've got to do is bring this back with us to the community and we've got to start changing the way we interact with the people around us. That's the key to the whole thing. So we can't address the government by using the parameters that it gives us because it constructed those parameters to protect itself. The whole legal system is constructed to protect the government. It's not constructed to protect you. 
it'll afford certain things to you. If you get in trouble, you get, you know, you get in someone, a fight or someone steals from you, sure, you can address it in that way, but ultimately it's there to protect itself, to stop you from ever addressing the system because you're always acting within those parameters. So we've got to step above it. But how do we do that? We can only do that through united communities. This is what I've been um, suggesting the whole time in all the seven years that I've been on air, that you've got to break down the barriers in your communities with all the people around you in the cities in which you live. You know, these ideas of united communities in other spots, like, like building alternate communities here and there, working models, these are great ideas to a certain extent, but they isolate you from the community at large. We don't need to build an alternate community, we need to fix the one that we've got. Because if we turn our back on this community, it's going to keep on eating up the rest of the world. That's what it's going to do. And it likes us to go and build these alternate communities because that keeps us busy. And we're not paying attention to what they're doing. And we need to pay attention to it, folks. We really do. And that's the box we need to get out of. Who here doesn't own a television? Excellent. Excellent. I haven't owned a television ever. I just, that's, yeah, good on you, folks. Good on you. So that's how it works, folks. It's a big puppet show. The whole thing is a puppet show. Hegelian dialectic. You know all about this. Of course you do. Problem, reaction, solution. Like I said, what do you do if you want to build a police state? You create more crime. How do you create more crime? You create more laws. With Obamacare, when Obamacare came in in the United States, Obama noticed that there would be the introduction of 40,000 new laws dealing with Obamacare, right? 40,000 new laws. This is the creation of 40,000 new crimes. And then they can say to you, look, the crime figures are terrible. Look at the crime figures. Oh, my God, there's so much crime. We need more police to deal with all this crime. You go outside and you look around, you're going, well, I'm not seeing any crime anywhere. But according to the figures, there's all this crime. It's because they've created all of these laws. Now it's illegal to step on the grass. It's illegal to do this. It's illegal to do that. It's illegal to fish on the beach on a Sunday. So there's all of these laws in place. So there's all this crime. So they need more police and they need more laws. More laws, more crime, more police. That's the way it goes. Hegelian dialectic. It's a scam. It's a scam. If we stopped obeying any legislation which interfered with our moral compass, things would change. You know? Question authority, folks. Question authority. Question any law which causes you to interfere with your moral compass. Question anything which puts you in a state of hardship. Because ultimately, government are public trustees. That's all they are. So I'm not really, I, I'm not looking for political solutions to any of this. I don't think there is one. I mean, there might be a way of creating some sort of political party and infiltrating the system from within and then changing things. That would be a good idea if you could find someone honest enough to do it. But ultimately, we have to change our perspective of what government is. Government is a group of public trustees that we appoint to look after our infrastructure for us. That's all it is. And if they're putting legislation in place which is putting us in a state of hardship we need to not have that legislation we need to disobey it but we can only do that if we have united communities we can only have that if we know ourselves enough to truly respect ourselves because if you truly understand what you are and understand the perfection of yourself you respect yourself and you see that in others i look at every person and i see a mirror of myself another frequency of that same consciousness experience life from that perspective so I respect that person. I'm happy to show my emotions to that person, but I don't attack that person. I don't hate, I would never hate that person. I don't know anybody that I dislike. I don't even like Benjamin Net. I mean, I don't even dislike Benjamin Netanyahu for bombing Gaza. I'm damn angry with him, but I don't dislike him. I don't really know how to hate anyone because I know what they are, because I felt it, I experienced it. And, and everything in my life has been synchronistic from that point. Like I said, when I really started off on this, this journey, I started hitting chat rooms and things, but then I, I started to realize that you, we create reality ourselves through our emotional state. We really do, the emotion that we're in, and most of the emotional state that we're in is fear. I mean, it's there in most people's minds. It's always there, dripping in the back of your mind, something to be worried about. And it's, it's a program, it's a program, and we're all, all running it. it it's, like a, it's like a pathogen. You know, but I realised we create reality ourselves. I thought, wouldn't it be great if I was a radio host? What a way to get the, w the word out to people. Wouldn't that be good if I could get all this knowledge, I could put it out on the airwaves. I wonder how you do that. So what I did was I got up and I sat at my computer every day and I did everything that I do. And I was making slideshows and putting them on YouTube and stuff like other people. And I put myself in the energetic state where I was a radio host. I was sitting there and I'm a radio host and people are listening to me and I'm saving the world. And within six weeks, I was contacted by a radio station in Kansas. Said, I saw one of your slideshows on YouTube, loved it, it was great. Do you want to come on the radio show and do an interview? 
I went, okay, no worries. Like, Is this a hit piece, you know? No, no, come on. So I went on and did this interview, and he said, that was great, they love you. Can you come back the next month and be my guest again? I said, okay. I said, that's great. Can, can you come back and be my regular Wednesday guest? I said, okay. Within one month, the radio station said they love your voice. They love the Australian accent. We would like you to have a radio show. Within six weeks, I had a radio show after changing my energetic state. Because reality mirrors things back to you. That's how reality works. See, Hegelian dialectic, it works for us as well. That's the thing. They, they hijacked that and gave you the law of attraction. Law of attraction, wealth and abundance. Manifest with your mind, manifest in duality and do it for money. That's what it's about. But it's not what it's about, it's a hijack. What it's about is your heart. The electromagnetic language that is going on between you and reality all the time. It's an electromagnetic language and if you listen to it, reality will steer you where you need to go. These conversations are going on but we just don't know it, we don't realise it because we've never been taught this. It's instinct, you know, it's, it's there, you know. Intuition, it's there, it's talking to you all the time but you're not listening. You know, it happens to all of us, you know. That's one of the things we've been led away from, you know. We've been led away from so much stuff. That's another one, religion. Religion is, is an interesting thing because when you look at a lot of the problems that we've got on the planet, a lot of it comes down to ownership, the belief of ownership. And personally, I think ownership is a fraud. You, you can't own anything. You're only here for a little while. You may be using stuff for a while. You may have paid money for it. But, you know, it's, it's not here. I mean, this, this computer, this is plastic. It's probably going to la outlast me unless it's put through a crusher. So how can I own something that will outlast me? How can I own the Earth? The Earth's been here for 4.6 billion years. I'm here, I've been here for 50, maybe 100 if I have a good run. It, 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 I, you can't own it. It owns me, the same thing. You know, and if, I've, if I won't leave home because of my computer and I'm scared someone will steal my computer, then the computer owns me. I'm locked to that spot by my computer. You know what I'm saying? It owns you. And it all, try, it all comes back to this, this monotheistic religions. And I'm, I hope I'm not offending anybody's religious beliefs, but I think monotheistic religion and, and the, the, the belief of ownership is, is one of the, the biggest problems we face. Way back in the, in the when, there was a covenant made between Yahweh and Abraham where Abraham was promised the land of Israel. And at that moment, ownership was, was put in the mind of someone. But what happened when Abraham was promised the land of Israel is he was promised to have this little peace and he was dispossessed of the entire earth, which is his heritage. Because that is the heritage of everybody. And by believing you can own a piece of it, you're dispossessed of the, of the earth. That's the way it works. And what these religious lines then did was they went out and they trained everybody else and dispossessed the entire world of their heritage. Borders only exist on a map. And, and races and, and, and countries and, and all of these things, th these, are, these are constructs. There's people, different sorts of people, born with different attributes and different aspects. But ultimately we're all in this together. Countries are a fiction, we made it up. And it's this belief of ownership has kept us warring with each other and clawing for a piece of the earth that's gonna be there after we die and belong to somebody else. And we've been doing this for thousands of years by the belief that we can actually own stuff. But we can't. It's, it's, it's a world of abundance and this, this belief of ownership separates us from that and it's been done through monotheistic religions. Right down the line, we believe we can own the earth, but we can't. She's a beautiful thing. She's alive, she's our mother, and we can't own her, she owns us. The Australian Aboriginals know this. They always say that they own the earth, they're custodians of it. That's what it does, it separates us. We have these little boxes, these little domes, these little places that we call our own. We put fences around them and, and that's our life. And it disconnects us from everybody around us. Communities like this would be better. It's a bubble. We live in these little bubbles of reality. We've got our little place, but it's just a bubble. And the people who believe they can just, you know, meditate, that's another religion, the new age belief system that we can just love and light, meditate our way out of this mess but we end up totally stressed out, it's not working, and we get the world that we've got today. So we've got to embrace the shadow, folks. We've got to face the darker side of ourselves. And that's what goes on in the world. That's why we have all of these problems, because all of these problems are giving us the opportunities to, to deal with them. So evil has to exist, because without evil, you don't have the opportunity to do good. Without evil, there's nothing to the experience. You've got to have the choice to go wrong in order to go right. It's what you do with the evil. That's, that's the thing. It's what you do with it, but it's got to be there. Otherwise, what would it all be about, you know? 
But there's, there's things, there's, it, it gets taken to a degree, it gets taken to an extreme. What the American uh, native traditions call watiko, the possession, the spirit that makes us do things that we know are bad for us, but we do them anyway. What is that? What makes us do that? They call it watiko. And they say, that is the origin of evil. Who knows? But we need to embrace that, folks, because that's what the powers that be do. It's a big game for them. They play our fears off against ourselves. They play our fears off, our, our good, what is good, what is bad. They always keep us in fear of everything. But a lot of it is fear of our own power. And that's one of the, bad, the biggest things of, of, our, of this control grid, folks, is our fear to step into our own power. But it's there. We've just got to, we've got to step into it, you know. We've got to realise that it is there, but we've lost it. So we've got to do it, folks. We've got to embrace the shadow, bring it together, and that's, that's how we heal things. That's the key. That's when we see the new beginning. And we've been given every opportunity to do this, as I said. But there's things that we look at. We look at them, but we don't address them. We don't face them. Okay? We, we always do this. We see the problem, and we, we, we try to address it by parameters that are given to us by the problem. We won't step into our power and simply call a spade a spade and say, hey, this is wrong. We're not going to do this anymore. That's why we need united communities. We've got to unite our communities. Anything you can find to unite your community. If you live in an apartment building and, you, and you're baking biscuits, bake some for the people next door, you know. Try to organise something. Maybe you've got your garden boxes. Put a, put a different vegetable in each garden box and grow a, an organic garden in the apartment block. Do anything you can to unite the community. I once had a thought, what if we, um, what if we got a, a suburb or a, or a city block and everyone took down their backyard fences and put this whole community garden in? put a pool in the centre for the kids, things like this. That'd be fantastic. There's another thing we could do, which I've been pushing in Australia, called the UAC, which is called the Urban Agricultural Cooperative. What you do if you've got a community, you find a bunch of people, 10 people, who want to put in market gardens. Put in three beds, keep one for yourself, put two into a cooperative, get the money from the cooperative and start your own bank. Start your own bank, so if we're using their fiat currency, at least we're using our own bank. So start your own bank. We've got a program going in Australia in the Northern Rivers where we're trying to link up all of the primary schools. So they all put in market gardens. The school kids learn how to grow vegetables as part of the curriculum at the primary school. They send market gardens out from the, from the primary schools. They start their own bank, which finances the whole education system in the area so they don't have to toe the government line. Right? We can still use their currency. We're forced to, but we can start our own bank. So the people are getting loans from this bank at 1% interest. If you're part of the cooperative, you get a little card, you can get a loan from that bank, which makes everybody want to be involved in it. And it steps us out of their system. You know what I'm saying? We've still got to use their paper for now, but that's okay, it's a stepping stone. We need to find stepping stones. See, people are bringing ideas of new systems to us. I think it's very difficult to construct a new system, such as uh, like the Ubuntu system. It might, it might be great, it might work in theory, but it's hard to get the whole world to step out of one system and step into another. It's a scary thing. They're not going to want to do it. I believe that if we can change our moral compass and start always acting according to moral parameters rather than legal parameters, it'll be an organic thing. The system will have to change with us. There won't be a choice for it. Because we created this whole mess. We all created it mainly by our inaction. We got led away from ourselves, led away from the art of ourselves, and we got taught that all of this fiction is real. And that's what this time is. It's an awakening to the fiction. That's why it's such a fantastic time to be here. There's so many things that we, we, we have that we don't look at. We, we, look at. we look at them, but we don't speak of them. It's, it's, uh, it's just not allowed. It's taboo. Which brings me back to Gaza. And I want to talk a little bit about Gaza. I actually went to Gaza Strip in 2012. Um, I wanted to know what was going on. Ever since I was a kid, I was fascinated with the place. Just the name Gaza, you know, it's just... It's this fascinating thing, you know. Like Z's. I was into Frank Zappa when I was a kid as well. But I always liked it and I always wanted to go there. And it always been in the news. And, and when I came to Europe in 2012, I got to England and I was with a man called Ken O'Keefe. And um, it's, uh, this is what goes on in Gaza. Ken O'Keefe, um, a friend of mine in England, and he'd actually been on the Marvi Marmor, the ship that attempted to break the Israeli blockade in, in uh, 2010, I think it was. Nine people were killed. It was quite, a, quite an intense mission. And he got the key to the city when he did that. And I'm in London, and I'm thinking, hey, man, let's go to Gaza. And he's going, well, you can't just go to Gaza. I'm going, you got the key to the city. What do you mean we can't go to Gaza, you know? He's going, well, yeah, true. So he's contacted some rebels, 
And uh, this wasn't Hamas, this wasn't any, any normal people, this was basically kids. And um, we ended up going to Cairo, we, we went across Rafa, they led us to this tunnel, and this wasn't any of these official tunnels that you hear about, any of these Hamas tunnels. This tunnel was dug by kids, teenagers who, who want to go and play with their friends in Egypt. You know, the kids want to play together. That's the Gaza is full of kids, there's so many kids there. And we got led to this tunnel, it was in this blown up building, it went down on an angle about like that, and then we crawled for over a kilometre, 50 metres underground for over an hour and a half, hour and a quarter, hour and a half underground on our hands and knees, just dirt about this high, crawling along. And we came up in this blown up building in Rafa. We got huddled out by these kids, like 17 to 18 year old kids. I think the youngest would have been about 10. And they smuggled us off to this car. And they, like, as soon as we pulled out of the hole, we put our baggage down and the kids just grabbed it and whoosh, they were gone. And we're, Okay, and then we get led off and rushed across and shoved into this car a couple of blocks away and all the kids disappear, came out of these buildings and pull all of our luggage in the boot, very, very organised and suddenly we were spirited off to Gaza City. We rented an apartment and hang out for 10 days. So I'm walking around Gaza Strip with a video camera, videoing people and, and interviewing people and ended up going up to the Ministry of Detainees and interviewing people up there. I gave a talk at the university, I'm going, where's all the terrorists, you know? And what I found in Gaza Strip was children. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children. So many children in Gaza Strip, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, Ken and I built a school room. This is my friend Omar. Omar's uh, still alive in there at the moment. I spoke to him yesterday. Go Omar. I've been so worried about this guy. He was our translator while we was in there and uh, he really looked after us. We, we just met him, he, a friend just said, this is my friend, he'll look after you. And he did, he's a, he's a wonderful young fella. This was speaking at the university in Gaza Strip where they, they gave me this cloth for speaking there. And these are, these are some of the kids that I met there. That's Omar again. The Samuni family, we built a schoolroom for these kids. There's so many kids in Gaza Strip, folks. 900,000 children in Gaza Strip. You've got to understand this conflict that's going on there. Everything you've been told about Palestine is a lie. It's a lie. These are beautiful people. I went to so many homes and so many people and I met so many families and I, I formed close relationships with so many people. I was only there for 10 days but I was so excited to have a Westerner there. And they, they so wanted the people to know that we're people. We just want to live like everybody else. We don't want war. We don't want any of this trouble. Some of the most beautiful children I've ever met in my life with battle scars that children should never have. There's this uh, shelter here. 15 children live in this shelter. Um, all of their, their uh, family was killed in cast lead, most of their parents, and uh, there's 15 of them, the most beautiful kids. They live under this, this, all these, these rags. There's no room in the houses for them, so that's where they're forced to live. They're looked after by the rest of the family, but this is where they're forced to live, you know? And the, still they smile with, with the scars, with everything they've got going for them. They're so happy to see you and they hold so much light. This was my friend Mace. You notice she's not wearing a hijab. This is in Gaza Strip. This is a Muslim woman in Gaza Strip, okay? She's not having a hard time. She's not wearing a hijab. She gave me a hug goodbye. This is a Muslim woman, folks, you know? And these kids, they're just kids everywhere, you know? And this is Gaza, and this is what they're doing at, to Gaza now. That was the power station going off, you know? This war on Gaza is a war on children. It's, it's, it's a war crime, and it's, it's, it's a blatant war crime. Regardless of what anybody says, it's a war crime. And the scariest thing about this war crime is that all of our governments are approving of this war crime, folks. All of our governments haven't really done anything. They've all stood by it. And again, it's based on the perception that ownership is real, that you can own a piece of the earth. And it's because you don't understand who and what you are that you would even do this to someone. You know, and, and, and it's unbelievable what's going on there, folks. And this is my friend Noor Harazin. And this is Noor standing on the edge of uh, what used to be a suburb. That's her down there in the left-hand corner. And there's people buried all under this. There's, there's tens of thousands of people missing. And the, uh, the ammunition that they're using, folks, I mean, I, I, like I said, I was going to come here and I was going to really go hard on this topic. But I, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to put it in the, in the perspective it needs. But it's important to be addressed. I mean, this is the ammunition that they're using, this, this dime ammunition, experimental ammunition. Literally tears the flesh from your bones. It's micro, micro shrapnel bears you down to the skeleton but doesn't damage the room. You know, this is, this is uh, insane weaponry. Personally, if I was given this type of weaponry by my commanding officer and asked to use it, I'd smash him in the face with a rifle butt 
drag him by the scruff of the neck off to the nearest police station and throw him on the floor. You know, then I'd go up the food chain and I'd find who ordered him to use it, and then I'd go further up the food chain and I'd find who invented it, and I'd have him committed to a psych ward because only a lunatic would invent this stuff. You know? These are the children that I built the school room for. These are beautiful kids. A little girl in the middle there, Noor. A little eight-year-old girl. Excuse me. Beautiful, beautiful girl. Powerful, powerful soul. I wanted to make a documentary about her. She's, excuse me, sorry. She's listed as with the missing. We don't know where she is. And um, she's a beautiful, beautiful soul. She's a beautiful girl. I truly met some wonderful, wonderful people in there, folks. And um, nothing you're told about them is true. They're beautiful, beautiful people. And again, this is, this is the, we can, we can call war crimes, we can address our governments, we can do all we, we can to stop this, but ultimately it's got to come down to the people of Israel. The people of Israel, the Israeli people, have to realise what's going on here. They've got to realise that, that this is not acceptable. You know, in fact, the Benjamin Netanyahu government, the, the actions, that the, the flack that this has brought on Israel is, is, is incredible. They, they're going to suffer so, so much for this. You know, and the Jewish people around the world are going to cop so much flack. When it's unnecessary, they're not even involved. What's involved is the Netanyahu government, but the only people who can address that are the people of Israel. But they have to remember who and what they are. They have to remember the government is a fiction. It's a group of public trustees. And if, if they love their country, they need to do something about this, this rogue government run by this child-killing psychopath. Because if they don't, this man is going to cause the implosion of Israel. The Benjamin Netanyahu government is, is, is in fact, by its actions, one of the most anti-Semitic organisations that's ever existed. Because it will destroy the state of Israel by its actions. You know? But again... What are we going to do about it? Are we going to, are we going to complain? Are we going to go and, and attack Israel for what it's done? These are innocent people as well. The whole thing is be, built on ownership, this concept of ownership that it's real, that we can own a part of the earth, that we're disconnected from each other. And it's a lie. It's fiction. You're all perfect at what you, what, exactly what you are. You're all here to be what you are and to express the art of your life. And you've been led away from that into this, this fictional bullshit world that allows this type of stuff to happen. You know, we've got to remember who we are, folks. That's the key to the whole thing. Cut the red tape. Cut all the bullshit. We don't need political remedies. We don't need to find ways through it to remanage the economic system. We need to change our perspective in our hearts, and it will be an organic process. The world will change with us. Put down all your stuff with people, because it's all fiction. It's all built on parameters that are not your own. Stuff that was designed to keep you in the state that you are and to keep you divided from everybody else. And it's a lie. It's all bullshit. You know, we could change the world in three seconds if we changed our perspective of reality and started operating in our heart. In everything that we do, all that we do. You know, I give so much to people. It's all I do is give and I don't even think about money. And I'm not a rich man. I don't have any money. But I've always got it when I need it because I don't care about it. I don't ever think about it. I don't ever worry that I don't have any. To me, it's a fiction. It's just something that happens. I don't think about it, and I give to all that I can. And so whenever I've, I need it, I've just got it. I just live in this state of abundance because that's where my heart is, and it's a mirror. It's all a mirror. Everything's a mirror. All, all of your emotional state is what controls your reality, all of this, you know. And our emotional state collectively is fear. It is. Even if we're in this, this love and light state, collectively... It's a fearful reality that we've created by the parameters that have been given to us. We're always in stress about something, collectively. We're worried about what may happen in the future, or we're in stress about what happened in the past, none of which exists now. So we're not in the now. We're too afraid to, to, to live. We're too afraid to die. I'm not scared of death at all. De death is a transition. This is just an expression. It's just an experience. I, I can't die. This can die. But I can't die because I'm connected to all it is. The same as everybody. This is just an experience. It's just a ride. It's what you do with that. It's what you do with the perspective. What knowledge do you gain? How did you improve reality by your presence in it? How did you improve? How did you make the world a better place? What breadcrumbs did you leave behind for the next time that you come? 
you know that's really what it's about that's what I believe it's about anyway that's what I got in that state of meditation you know and when I had that someone said to me that sounds like a DMT experience I mean I don't know so they, they told me about it so much and I, so I thought okay I'll try some DMT and it wasn't it wasn't like that at all but DMT is an interesting thing isn't it DMT is your it's the code you can use to access the tryptophan and everything the tryptophan and everything is the antenna and you can, if you, if you had your, the DMT flowing in your body the way it's supposed to and your pineal gland was open and it was being distributed the way it's supposed to, I believe that you can access and, and communicate with all of reality via the tryptophan that's in everything. And it's called instinct. It's what we call instincts. Animals have these. When a tsunami comes, the animals all leave and run to the high ground. A lot of tribal cultures leave and go to the high ground as well because they know, because they can read the universe energetically. We've lost all of that. A lot of the reason we've lost it, it isn't just due to our diet, a lot of it is due to our left brain education. The fact, the fact that we think in language. The right brain just isn't active anymore. Well, it is in a lot of people, but it isn't in a lot of people as well. You know? So I think that's, that's a big part of it, you know? So we're, we're getting there though, folks. We're getting through all this stuff. Full Circle Project was another project uh, that I had planned for this year. See, I had all these plans for this year. I had a plan to save the Amazon. I was going to start the Full Circle Project and I was going to start this big buyback scheme for the Amazon rainforest. But then I realised there's so much more. What happened was I found out that there's this... I was having so many difficulties putting this film together. I went there last year, I started creating a documentary. I am having so much trouble getting it to flow and I couldn't figure out why. I thought, well, I need more information. So, of course, a trip manifested to come and get more information. And then Gaza Strip happened and then I found out about this as well. The Peruvian government has spent, like... 75 million dollars just on promoting this Kamasi gas project which is a multi-billion dollar project so there's no way with anything I'm going to do with the full circle project is to be able to raise the money to, to deal with this sort of problem so the full circle project had to be adopted to something wider and then Gaza happened and I started to realize what Gaza really represents when I started to realize that all of our governments approve of this that's the scary part is that all of our governments approve of what's going on in Gaza. They're making noise now, but they haven't made noise until we started really protesting. Then they started making noise about it because they kind of have to, because they know we're going to vote them out if they don't. <coughs> Excuse me. So they've started making noise. But the scary part about it is that what's going on in Gaza is a planned ethnic cleansing. Okay, It's not a war. It's a planned ethnic cleansing. I don't care what they tell you. You don't take... 60,000 troops and a column of tanks into an area of 25 five miles long, 5 miles wide, with 1.8 million people, 900,000 children hemmed in by a 50-foot wall in order to clear out a few tunnels. Okay, this is genocide. That's what they planned to do, go in and take out as many people as they could. They hit the UN school, they said, oh, we didn't mean to hit it, there was a rocket attack, there was a, a Hamas rocket base there. No, what, why they hit the UN school is because they sent out coordinates that that was a safe place to go. 17 times they sent out the coordinates and they knew there was 3,000 people there, mainly women and children, and so they bombed it. That's what they do. And it's genocide. It's a planned ethnic cleansing. And our governments are approving of this, folks. So we need to, we need to take the matter in hand because this will be the trend of the future because this isn't Rwanda, this isn't Panama, this isn't a, a third world country somewhere. This is a major G8 democratic nation that's carrying out this act. And, and even if it is an ethnic cleansing, the, the civilian casualties and the weapons being used against children is unacceptable and our governments are approving of it. So it's time that we remember ourselves and, and take this matter in hand in a peaceful manner. You know, Civil disobedience, but peaceful civil disobedience. But we're not going to achieve it if we don't have a united community. So again, it comes back to self-discovery. See, every problem that we have comes back to self-discovery. That's the thing. It's no good putting band-aids on symptoms all the time. We've got to really look at what the root cause of the problems is, folks. And whatever you look at, whether it's pollution, whether it's the whaling, whether it's Gaza, whether it's, it's mining with coal seam gas mining, starvation, homelessness, whatever it is, it's usually done by companies that are allowed to get away with this stuff due to legislation that's been put in place by government. And government is allowed to do that because we have forgotten, or we've been trained to forget, the government are simply public trustees that must do what the people demand. But they've kept us so divided that there's no way we can, we can deal with that. They've done it through multiculturalism as well. I mean, I love multiculturalism. I love multiple cultures, but let's keep the cultures where they belong. Why would, why would someone want to move to one country? Like, why would someone from, from, from Thailand want to move to England and then create the Thailand sector in England 
Board England want to move to Thailand and create the English Quarter. If you're going to go to Thailand, become part of the culture, so the culture remains there. Because everywhere you go when you travel now, it's the same as everywhere else. Multiculturalism is in fact homogenizing the whole planet and it's dividing all of our communities because people because people are kept in, in these little bubbles and you can never unite your community. You know what I'm saying? The, the, the people come, they get given all these subsidies by government and so they think the government's great. All the locals don't like the, the, the newcomers because they get all the subsidies they don't. They don't even know about it. So it, you, can't, you can't ever unite your communities. That's what it's all about. So we've got to look to a higher harmonic. And the higher harmonic is here, in La Kesh. In La Kesh, I'm another yourself. That's, that's the key to the whole thing. Every radio show I do, I finish with that. In La Kesh, I am another yourself. We are all each other. And if we can realize who and what we are and see the perfection of ourselves, and we can see it in others, all the barriers fall away. It doesn't matter what race you are, doesn't matter what color you are, doesn't matter what religion you choose to adhere to. Ultimately, we're just people. We're all different frequencies of the same consciousness. And we can do this if we realize that. I really believe that if you have stuff with people, if you don't like people, it's because you don't know yourself. That's the key to the whole thing, folks. It really is. There's so much more I was going to say. Like I said, with these talks, I've, I've got another million slides to get through. But we can do it, folks. Embrace the warrior spirit. Shoot an arrow of love at the world. We can do that. But we've got to bring back the warrior spirit. The men have got to step up to this. We've had a lot of bringing back the divine feminine and we've needed to because it's been so suppressed in this patriarchal society. But the bringing back of the divine feminine has been done in such a fluffy way that we've created a lot of fluffy men along the way as well. So it's time to bring back the divine masculine. It really is. We've got to step into our, into our, into our masculine power, folks. And we've got to stand tall and protect our women, protect our families. You know, civil disobedience, but in the right way. It's a beautiful quote. We do that, we can create any reality we want, folks. Once we step into our power, bring back the divine feminine, but don't lose the divine masculine in the process because we need you. We need the men to stand up. We do. She wants us to. The Gnostics, according to the Gnostics, anyone here familiar with Gnosis, the Gnostic teachings, the Sophianic myth? Anybody know the myth of Sophia? Well, the myth of Sophia, the, the earth is a living organism that we call Gaia, the Gnostics call her Sophia. They say she can correct the imbalance of the evil that is on her, but she needs a certain percentage of the human race to step up with her. And I believe that's why this awakening is happening, because people are becoming active, because she's correcting herself. But we have to step into it. We have to step into our divinity, folks. We really do. We've got to step into it, or that's where we're going to go. That's where we're going to go. That's where we're going to go. We're, get, we're there now. We're just going to keep going if we don't step into it. And we can. We can step into the whole thing. Beautiful artwork, Adam Scott Miller. Here it is, folks. Civil disobedience is not our problem. Our problem is civil obedience. Our problem is that numbers of people all over the world have obeyed the dictates of the leaders of their government and have gone to war and millions have been killed because of this obedience. Our problem is that people are obedient all over the world in the face of poverty, starvation and stupidity and war and cruelty. Our problem is that people are obedient while the jails are full of petty thieves and while the grand thieves are running the country. That's our problem. So folks, embrace the divine masculine. We can deal with any chaos in front of us. We can do it. All right, everybody, give it up for Max Egan. Show this man some love. Free Palestine. All right, Max, I wanted to say um, something positive and reassuring that I've noticed in England. Um, I don't know if you're aware about the situation with Jon Snow, the British uh, newsreader. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with Britain and Britain's news, Jon Snow, who was a presenter of Channel 4 News, went over to Palestine, and he was pretty much phased in the same way that you are. And when he came back, he's been barely been able to contain his emotions, and he's been saying, this has to stop. And, um, you know, the BBC is still the mouthpiece for the government over there. We've got you know, David Cameron and Ed Miliband and all the rest of them who are still saying they're pro-Israel. And, um, you know, Channel 4 News has taken the opposite view. On top of that, in North London, as well as in New York, you've had a lot of Orthodox Hasidic Jews that are standing out against Zionism now as well. And uh, I think um, they can't milk this anymore. I think this is the end. Well, it, it is. It's yeah. the end. But it, it, it's important that it doesn't turn into a let's hate the Jews, you know, which is what it's designed to do. See, 
what Benjamin Netanyahu is doing, I believe, is, is running through the Revelation script. And it says in Revelation that everyone has to hate Israel so all the Jews come home. So I think he's doing this. And it's, it's, the, the, the people of Israel themselves can deal with it by simply dealing with their government, realizing these are just public trustees and they're bringing about the implosion of their state. You know, so, you know, it's important to, to you know, and, and you've got to address it as well. We've got to be able to address this issue because this is a war crime and it cannot, we cannot allow a war crime of this magnitude behind the hide, to hide behind the word anti-Semitic because it's not anti-Semitic to be pro-life and, and, and a war against children is not acceptable under any standards. You know, so yeah, John Snow's done a great thing and it's really good to see. I'd just like to ask you, what would you suggest? Closer, please. Sorry, what would you suggest as individuals that we can do? Um, you've made a few kind of suggestions about community gardens, but I think a lot of people see this that's going on, and in my experience, I'm speaking to an awful lot of young people who are waking up to it. But I think people feel a little bit, well, what can I do? I'm just an individual. What can you do in regard to Gaza or in in, in in the whole um, scheme, you know, the fact that we want to change the, the planet? Well, you've got to unite with the people around you. See, often we know people around the block or down the road, but we don't even know our neighbours, you know. We've got to start breaking down these barriers of judgement that we have with people because it's a program. It's all, it's all programs, you know. Like I said, if, if you don't like somebody, it's something about yourself you haven't discovered yet. You've got to realise that this is just a perspective of consciousness. And that, that, I believe, is the whole thing. Like I said, if, you, if you're baking a cake, bake one for the lady next door. Even if you don't like her, bake her one. Go do something with her. Even if you don't like it, go and do something that she likes to do just to break down the barriers and start to talk to people on their terms so they can find out what sort of a person you are. Lead by example in what you do. In respect to Gaza, what can you do about Gaza? You can put pressure on your government to uh, allow um, discussions which will bring about terms for ceasefire and terms for truce that are acceptable on both sides not just have Egypt and Israel say here are the terms because the terms are you stay in prison under our terms because Gaza Strip is essentially the world's biggest open air prison it's a modern day version of the Warsaw Ghetto that existed in World War II is what it is and it's not acceptable so you can put pressure on your government and you can put pressure on the Egyptian embassy to open rough a border flood them with phone calls and letters that would be a great help thank you for that anybody else? Hello. Um, I just want to thank you for coming. I just think that it's been the most powerful speech that I've actually heard all week. Well, thank you. Thank and, you so um, much. And, and when I leave here, this is my first boom, and I go back to New Zealand, um, um, I will definitely be taking this back with me. So just thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I really, really appreciate it. Um, hello. Hello. I really enjoy your speech. Uh, just one question. Do you, do you think that um, monetary system has to end in order to um, this unity start? And do you know anything about the Venus Project by the Sir Jack Fresco? Okay. Like I said, I don't, I don't think anyone will step into another system. I really don't. I think the Venus Project scares too many people because of its, its machine-like qualities. I think there's good aspects to it. I think it should be brought to the table. I think we shouldn't just say, ah, oh, this is the new world order, the way a lot of people do. We should bring it all to the table and put all the egos aside. That's the hard part when bringing all these things to the table is getting the egos aside. But I really believe that we don't need to construct any new system at all. This system could work if we changed our perspective and, and always operate according to our moral compass. If we did the right thing in all that we do and don't abide by any legislation which causes you to deviate from your moral compass or which causes harm and address that issue. If, if legislation causes harm, how does a public trustee have the right to introduce legislation which, which puts people in a state of hardship? This is abuse of office, this is breach of trust. And if we have changed our perspective and have connected with everybody, we can just say, hey, uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to do something else. Because all we need government for is to manage our infrastructure because we've got these ridiculous things we call cities which somehow got created. For, I don't know who thought them up, but they don't really don't serve us, you know. But I think it's all come, it comes down to here. I think a working model will, will come out of our newfound consciousness. It has to. It has to be an organic thing. If we change, it has to change with us. What else can it do, you know? 
Hello. Hello. <laughs> I just wanted to say um, that the fear that you talk about in society, the state of fear, it feels for some people that it's so deep that they don't even realize they're in it. And that what I want to take from Boom and in general is just the sense that um, the opposite of fear is this confidence and this, what do you call it, divine, divine male presence, divine female, that when we're feeling that resistance from other people because of this fear, that we just need to remember that confidence and yeah. that... We do. We've got to be kind and patient to the people that don't know that they're in that state. And thank you to everyone here for reminding us of that. You know, it's really brilliant. We have time for one more question. One more question. It's, it's all fear-based mind control, the whole system. It is, you know, to, to greater or lesser degrees, all of it, you know. But ultimately, it, it comes down to a fear of, fear of death and... Of, often it's a fear of self-responsibility. We're, we're very scared of, of our own power, very often, you know. But this is a, a great awakening, and it's a great yeah, time to be here because that's what this is. Everyone's rediscovering what we really are, you know. It's, it's the best time in history to be alive. I, um, I just wanted to um, say something uh, as an add to what you're saying because I found out with the work that I do that there's an easy way to get a little bit closer to yourself, who you are, and to connect to other people because we've been really, really drawn very far away from that by governments, by systems, and the only thing we can do is just think about how we have to create more money to survive, and we just, well, we don't. Apparently, we don't have TVs, which is pretty awesome, but most of the people are just locked up in that cage. Um, a way to get out of that is indeed by showing compassion, empathy, you were just crying. I mean, I've been working on that for a while. You cried. I cried like a baby because Max was crying, and I like Max. And when Max is crying, I cry. And I think, for instance, a good thing to do is to keep it really local because we can. You are in the. You go to the Gaza, so you work there. But in your neighborhood, really, people need your help. Just go out of your house, knock the neighbor's door, and ask them what they need. It's going to be a bit awkward at first, but when you do it and you see the response and you get that certain emotion that comes with it, your life is going to be changed from that moment on. And because you start a relationship with that neighbor, you will probably do the same thing soon, later, maybe even in contact with someone in a bus. Maybe when you're, you know, like traveling, you start opening your eyes, communicating easier, laughing, smiling easier, and then it will change because then we connect and then we realize that that is essence. Connection, compassion, empathy is the only way that we're going to ever be happy together. It's not about what you can fix 10,000 miles away from you. It's what you can fix in that few square meter that you're living at. It's simple. It's really simple. Thank yeah. you, Max. It, I am blown away by your talk. It is something, actually, that's very significant what you just said. In that experience that I had, when everything went woof, when I, I started crying from that, that meditation, what I found was that the, the very fabric of the matrix, the very fabric of reality itself, if, if, if energetic substance can have an emotion, it's compassion. That is the very fabric of reality, because without compassion, atoms couldn't even bind together if they didn't have compassionate relationship with each other, you know? And empathy is, is, is your interface. 